um, and and um, not that it was bad when I was growing up, but uh, she was not someone with whom you should trifle. Back in the day, when when, when she when she got a certain facial expression, if you were smart, uh, you avoided trouble. I was not smart, so I did not avoid a lot of trouble. But um, and now she she wants to pretend like that none of that ever occurred. I guess when you get grandkids, you get a little bit of amnesia. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but I, I watch her with with uh, my children and my my siblings' children, and it's just been listen. It's a blessing. We can we can have now. I'm not saying we don't argue. We I mean I come from a loud family. If you can imagine that, um, but there, we we can all get together and there's not a lot of fighting and cussing, carrying on, people getting drunk, uh, all that sort of thing. And, uh, but I mean there are people in the world that don't know any better. That that that's, that they don't that they never had the training. But I'm thankful that I had the training. My mother and my father. Uh, I I can say people don't believe this. But I can say that I never heard them argue. I never heard them argue. Now, I'm not saying they didn't. There were times when we knew there were times when we knew there was a dispute going on. But they would go out on the porch or that once we got older, they could leave us at the house. They'd go get a Coke or, you know, something. And, but they were very they, they were very concerned about the, 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 their demeanor in front of us. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and they instilled certain things in me and, and my mother was a big part of that because my dad was gone a lot he was off work and doing stuff and mom was the one at home with us so I certainly do appreciate and love my mother I sent her a text this morning they, they are in they are in Valdosta Georgia the, the, the Sam Mayhew was hooded yesterday which means he got he got hooded for his doctoral degree he, he's, he's Dr. Sam Mayhew now and they went through the ceremony and had pictures on Facebook so they're all over there we weren't able to go but I do want to say again that I appreciate my mother and my mother-in-law and my wife. I put a I put a thing on Facebook last night about the the three most important women in my life. My my sisters are all good mothers, but I'm glad that I was raised by a Proverbs 31 woman. And when I got ready to get married, I went looking for a Proverbs 31 woman, and I found one. Now it took me a long, 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 long time. For those of you that think I'm exaggerating about what I went through to get my wife, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating at all. But in, in her defense, she had to wait on me for a little while because I wasn't worth marrying at 19, brother. So if you can, I, I know you can't even believe that, you know. But I wasn't worth marrying in any sense of the word at 19 years old. But the Lord brought us together and we're going to raise our, we're, we're going to raise our daughter to, Lord willing, we're going to raise our daughter to be the most pre to, to have the most precious position in God's hierarchy, and that is a Proverbs 31 housewife. You can't listen. These people talk about demeaning women. You can't get any more valuable of a position than a Proverbs 31 housewife. It doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter. Whether or not you can play ball as good as the boys, none of that matters. None of it matters. What matters is the most precious position in God's hierarchy is a Proverbs 31 wife. And that is what we're going to raise our daughter to be, Lord willing, with, with his help and wisdom. We're going to work together and do that. And, and the reason, and, and this is kind of a, this is not part of the message at all, but the reason we got transgender bathrooms and social acceptance of same-sex marriage is because, is because heterosexual marriage Many, many decades ago, before all this happened, heterosexual marriage left the principles of Proverbs 31 and other biblical principles behind. That's how we got here. That's how we got here. But anyway, that's, that, that's, I, I'm, I'm not going to deal with Mother's Day today. We're going, we're, 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 going into the, we're going into the book of Matthew. That's just a preamble. That's a preamble. I say we're going into the book of Matthew. We have to. Yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Brother Ron, get the mic. Miss Kelly has a. Okay. Okay. I, I'll see if I can work that out. Miss Kelly's lobbying for somebody to take my job. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't. I should have been here. I should have. Listen, I was borderline in the hospital last week. I guess I should have been here. Yeah. I, I'm about to lose it. <laughs> but, uh, but before we get specifically into the book of Matthew, we need to deal with some uh, intertestamental times and we need to discuss, you know, uh, the, we need to discuss some context and why things were done the way they were done. Um, God is a God of order. God is a God of order, and, and you have to, you have to at least give a give, give some time to the idea of why does why does the person of Christ? Because we know Christ has been around in, in eternity past. G, G, listen, Jesus existed in, in all the eternities past before the babe in the manger. Jesus has been around as long as God's been around. He is God. They're one and the same. Now. It's odd because I've got, I've got, uh, I, I have, there was a reason for me to have a discussion. I don't want to go into a lot of detail. There's about this thing called oneness. Well, I believe in one God. The Bible does not teach three gods. We are not polytheistic. That means many gods. We're not polytheistic. We're monotheistic. That means one God. But that one God does have three functions. There is a Godhead. There, there, there is, and, and, the, and I'm aware the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The Bible uses the word Godhead. The doctrine of the triune God is in the Bible. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 says, These three are one. These three bear witness in heaven. These three bear witness in heaven. And these three are one. But so, so, so at no time has God ever ceased to be God. At no time did Jesus ever cease to be God. At no time while he was on earth was the throne ever empty. You say, explain it. I don't have to. I, I, I know what I need to know in order to believe it. I know everything I need to know in order to believe it. And, and God made us as triune creatures, by the way. He, as an object lesson to help us understand it, we're body, soul, and spirit. We're, that's three in one. Body, soul, and spirit. The body's what you're looking at. It's old and tired. I was looking at myself in the mirror this morning, couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when I looked at myself in the mirror. This is my body. The soul is what's going to last forever. Soul's gonna, the, the soul is going to last forever in heaven. I'm going to be where, I'm going to live however long God lives. The spirit is the inner man, the seat of your emotions. So, we're, we're, so we are a triune creature. Not only that, but we serve various functions in life. I don't speak to my mother the way I speak to my children. I would not do that at all. Why? Because I, 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 don't, go to my, I don't serve that function with my mother. We have different functions. My point in saying all that is, why, Brother Ron, if you would get the mic. See... Jesus' ministry in life and teaching, we're going, we're going to be look at, we're going to be looking at the, the, the teachings of Christ through the book of Matthew. We'll, we'll reference some other gospels, but for however many weeks it takes, I, I guess it's going to take about a year, I, I guess. But, but we're, we're going to look at the teachings of Christ through the book of Matthew, and, and we're just going to present you with some possibilities, some, some perspectives. But we, we have to ask the question, you know, why did God, God is a God of order. The, 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 Bible, the Bible was, was penned by men who were inspired by God to write certain things. We're not told the full revelation. We're, not, we're told everything that we need to know to go to heaven, but, but the Bible doesn't share with us everything Christ did. The book of John said, that if, that, that, that if everything was written that Christ did, the world couldn't contain the books. That's what the book of John says. And, and then the last two verses of the book of John, um, somebody, somebody turn to John chapter 20. Brother Dewey, if you would turn to John 20 and read verses 20 and 21. There was a time I could quote it, but I'm embarrassed to say that I can't now. You say 20 and 21? Yes, sir. 
And when he had so said, he shewed unto them the hands, his hands in his side. Okay, that's not it. Go to the 30 next chapter. 30 and 31? Uh, go to the next chapter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go, Is that go. what you want? John's got, John's got 21 chapters, right? Yeah, go, go to uh, the last chapter and read the last two verses in the last chapter. Okay. Uh, this is the disciple which should testify these things. Okay, well, where is it, brother? Do you want 30 and 31 of chapter 20? 30 and 30, okay, okay that's where it is. And many other signs truly did that's Jesus it. in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Believe it or not, I am prepared to do this. But I'm putting in verses that's not in my outline. But but the but the Bible says that many other things he did. But but so so what is written was written for a certain purpose, ma'am. Okay, that that's the that's the other verse that says the things that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the books. It's twenty one twenty five. So anyway, the the Bible was written with a purpose. We're not necessarily told everything that happens in the Bible. We're not, we're, we're not told everything that occurred during the time of Christ. These things are written with a purpose. So thinking of that purpose, why is it, why, why, why is it that Christ comes along pretty much at the, at the end of the revelation of the scripture? Okay, we have, we have some 4,000 years of scripture and time and human activity that transpires before Christ comes on the scene as the babe in the manger. Now we know that Christ appeared in the Old Testament several times. It's called a Theophanes or Christophanes. When Christ appears in the Old Testament with a body, matter of fact, very early on in the book of Genesis, a, a voice, it says a voice, a, walk, a voice walking through the garden. Well, how does a voice walk? Well, that's Jesus. That's Jesus appearing in, the, in, in, appearing in his eternal body, which he gave up in order to become our sacrifice. So why does Christ appear where he does in the Revelation? Now, obviously, nobody can give a dogmatic answer, but these, these are just questions that we have to entertain. See, the, the, the Old Testament, I know, I know brother, uh, brother Cohen doesn't like that term, but that's the only term I know to use. The Old Testament... The Old Testament is, is basically the history of the first Adam. It's, it's the history of the first Adam and everything that occurred, everything that occurred as a result of the first Adam. Then Jesus, of course, he's the second or the last Adam. So, so we have to consider, number one, why did Christ, why does Christ show up on earth as a man at this particular time in the Revelation. Does anybody have a comment on that? Any, anybody have an opinion or a comment on that? All right, Brent, give the mic to Brother Joe. Might that have something to do with Galatians 4? But what does Galatians 4 say? Time, God sent forth his son, made a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. See, so, so Christ came to redeem us, of course we know, but we, would we appreciate, would we be able to appreciate as much what he did with, without, the, without the Old Testament? Without seeing what they were under, without seeing what they went through. So that's one reason. All right. The, the next thing you have to consider is all the different, all of the different mechanisms. See, the, Another verse that's mentioned in Galatians 4 is a particular phrase the Bible uses on occasion. It's called the fullness of time. The fullness of time. God began to set things up way back when Adam sinned. See, redemption was, the, the plan of redemption was in place before the foundation of the world according to Hebrews 9.26. So God had to set some things in place. So by the time Christ came on the scene, you, ha you had all the prominent players that were working to, to, because he had to be betrayed. He, ha he had to be the, the mock trial, the phony trial. All these things had to occur. See, uh, because all these, uh, uh, another issue here is all these hundreds of prophecies, if not thousands, 
All these hundreds of prophecies had to be fulfilled. In the Old Testament, there's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And one of the functions of Matthew is Matthew shows that Christ is the embodiment of these prophecies. See, that's why in 28 chapters, Matthew's 28 chapters, and in 28 chapters, over 14 times, Matthew brings up prophecy. Matthew brings up this was done that the prophecy might be fulfilled. This was done that the prophecy might be fulfilled. This was done. So, so because of the Old Testament, Matthew could substantiate who Christ was to the Jews. See, Matthew is the only gospel that's written exclusively to the Jews. Exclusively. Matthew is written to show Christ as the king of the Jews. Brother Donnell. Um, would it be worthwhile maybe to um, bring up the, the principle, though, that though uh, certain portions of the scripture are written to specific individuals or groups, they're still written for us as well. I was just about to ask that question. I was literally just about to ask that question. All right. Now, now, now to, to bring up Brother Donnell's point, Matthew is written to the Jews. Matthew, all, all the gospel writers, they, they, they were, and, and when I say God, I'm not saying a man wrote the Bible. I'm saying God used, for, see, have you ever thought about why we don't have a harmony of the gospels in the Bible? There, 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 there have been a lot of harmony books written. Where, and when I say harmony, I mean where you can see every account of the Gospels side by side by side. You can see all the accounts in Mark, all the accounts in John, all the accounts in Luke, all the accounts in Matthew. You can see them side by side. They're called harmonized books of the Gospels. And, I, and I've read a couple of them. I've got a couple of them. But that's not how the Bible, that's not how God presented it to us. There's nothing wrong with it. That's how, that's, but that's not how God presented it to us. God gave us four distinct perspectives of Christ. Each one of these gentlemen, godly men, wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what inspiration means. They wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit and Matthew presents him as king of the Jews. Mark presents him as a servant of the Lord. Luke presents him as son of man to the Gentiles and John presents him as God. So, 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 so when you look at, when you, when you read John, for example, because every gospel has a purpose. Every gospel has an agenda. When, when, you, when, when you read John, from the next time you read John, every, every event that you read in John, ask yourself this question. Every single event that you read in John, ask yourself, how does this event prove that Jesus is God? This event I'm reading right now, how does it prove Jesus is God? Every gospel writer... They, they had a motive for what they were doing. Matthew's motive was to present, was to prove to the Jews the one that's been prophesied of, he's here. He's been prophesied for thousands of years and he's here. See, Mark doesn't bring up prophecy as much as Matthew does. Mark doesn't bring up fulfilled prophecy. Why? Because Mark was written primarily to a non-Jewish audience. They wouldn't have known anything about it. But the Jews would have understood it. The Jews would have understood it. So to Brother Donnell's point, what is the point of us going through Matthew if it's written to the Jews? What's the reason for it? All right. You got, okay. It's written for us to understand. Oh. Okay. All right, let's get into it a little more. Why spend however long we're going we're to spend? Because we're not going we're not going to necessarily go through every chapter and verse in Matthew. We're not, we're, not, we're not going to necessarily do an expository study of the book of Matthew. But why spend time going through the book of Matthew if Matthew's written to the Jews? To show Christ as king of the Jews. Somebody give me some Bible verses. All right. Say it in the mic. They want to get you on the CD. <laughs> it says, study to show thy... Uh, self-approved unto God rightly right. dividing we need to know as much uh, about Jesus as the king as anything okay he's coming all right brother Grover 
Grover Patrick up here and then Brother Donnell. I forgot what verse it is, but it says that all Scripture yes. is... is uh, for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness? Yes, sir. What's the reference, Brother Donnell? 2 Timothy 3.16. I couldn't remember it either. See, uh, but, but brother, br brother, thank you, brother. Br brother, uh, brother Stone brought up an interesting point. Uh, see, if, if Christ, uh, okay, brother, brother Donnell, okay, brother Kevin McConnick over here. We get to hear it on the radio station twice a day. Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for... It is the power of the God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Also to so the Greek or the non-Jew. The first book of the Bible is Matthew, uh, of the gospel, and that's to the Jew. Yes, sir. Um, Brother Stone brought out an interesting point just in past. If Christ is presented as king of the Jews, then there would have to be a kingdom, is that correct? There would have to be a kingdom. See, Matthew is the kingdom gospel. There, there, is a, there, there, there is a literal kingdom that's going to occur. A li the, the scripture, ends, scripture ends with an eternal kingdom and Christ sitting on the throne of David. We're going to get into that. Okay, if you're saved, you have a stake in that kingdom. I, I have a stake in that kingdom. And, and, and by the way, the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel is the same thing. You can't, you, you can't be a part of the kingdom without trusting Christ as your Savior. The, 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 king, the, the kingdom requirement is the salvation of redemption through Christ. It's the same thing. So we have a stake in this. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew. But I have a stake in this. And see, yes, it is written specifically to the Jews. Listen, if you were going to show if you were going to spend some weeks in a Bible study with a Jewish individual and, and show them Christ in Scripture, if you, if you were going to validate the New Testament to a Jewish individual, the best book for you to use would probably be the book of Matthew. Because it presents Christ as the King of the Jews. And by the way, just so we're, I mean, this is week one, so we got a lot to cover. But there is a literal physical kingdom that will be established here on earth and the theme is all through scripture the theme is all through scripture this idea of the kingdoms within you that's true but that's not what the book of Matthew is talking about the book of Matthew is talking about a physical literal kingdom that's going to be set up on earth where it's going to last for a thousand years and then some other things are going to happen then that kingdom is going to go on into eternity I will be a part I'm not a Jew I'm not Sometimes I wish I were. But, but, but I will be a part of that kingdom because of my Savior. So the book of Matthew presents Christ as the king of the Jews. That's why it was written. The very first word, uh, some of the, I think it's in the very first verse. We'll look at it in a minute. But the very first words of the book of Matthew presents Christ as the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right out of the gate, Matthew presents him as the son of David and the son of Abraham. And in the Jewish culture, you can't get any bigger than David and Abraham. And a close third would be Moses, Miss Kelly. Give the, bring the mic to Miss Kelly. I can get this straight. Matthew presents him as the king of the Jews. And we know him as... God is the Son of God. Um, the, the reading the gene, genealogy, the genealogy, can be confusing to new Christians or people that don't know the Bible. But the key verse in verse in uh, Matthew one, he's the King of the Jews. Verse 15, sixteen, Jacob. After it has this genealogy line beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And in Luke 
3, it gives the genealogy of Joseph himself. He was a godly man, but he was not the daddy of Jesus. Yes. We know that. And in verse um, 31, chapter 3, 31, I'm sorry. Mm, I lost it. it. It tells about Jacob's, uh, Joseph's lineage, and it goes all the way back to Adam. Yes, it's good. He's we're the son of man. Yeah, we're going to get into that. That's good because okay. because uh, because the um, Joseph. Now nobody cares at this point in the Jewish history, but technically speaking, Joseph is the rightful king of Israel. Is the rightful king of Israel at the time Christ comes on the scene. Joseph is in the Solomonic line of Israel. So, so when Joseph adapts Jesus, because we know that he's not Jesus' earthly father, when, when Joseph adopts Jesus, adapts, when, when Joseph adopts Jesus, then, then, then Joseph receives, through the right of the kings, is passed down to the father, so, so, then, so then Jesus receives all the, all the kingly rights passed down through Joseph. See, Jesus was not, uh, obviously was not just some Yehu, but 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 he, but but he was given the right of the kings through his father Joseph, who was in the Solomonic line. Matthew gives us the Solomonic line to validate Christ's credentials. Now, if you, now if you go to Luke, <clears throat> which gives us Mary's lineage, if you go to Luke, which takes up which takes Christ all the way back to Adam to to give him his roots in humanity, because that's Luke's agenda to present Christ as the Son of Man, which is more or less a Gentile title, and King of the Jews is a Jewish title. But Luke presents, uh, Mary is also, a, Mary is also a, a daughter of David through, an, through another son. Mary is a daughter of David through Nathan. So Jesus is not just some kid, Jesus is not just some kid that, that Joseph decided to adopt. Jesus is really, he, he really is the son of David. He, he, because he's connected to David on Mary's side through, through David's son Nathan. He's connected to David through the right of the kings on Solomon's side through, or, 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 through, through the Solomonic line of his adopted father, Joseph. So you see how all this, you see how God set all this up? That's why it's so absurd. <clears throat> it is absurd to think that everything just happened. Everything just happened. You know, the sun just happens to be just far enough away from the earth that we're, we don't get cooked. Well, we get cooked metaphorically. We don't get cooked, uh, we don't get cooked uh, and we don't freeze to death. 93 million miles away from the earth is where the sun is. But all this, and, and, and sometimes we all wish it was just a little bit further away. But see, God is a God of order. See, that's what, that's, what, that's what Galatians is talking about in the fullness of time. See, when God had, when God had everything set, when, God had, when everything was set, <clears throat> a young woman, a godly young woman gave birth to God in the flesh. When he had the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians all fighting for power. You know, they were all, they were, they were, and over the course of the next 33 years, they would get all worked up to the point to where they would betray their own Savior. And some of them knew who he was. They knew exactly who he was. Listen, the lineage we're talking about, see, to the Jewish people, to the Jewish people, lineage was very important because it could be proven. <clears throat> it could be proven. Do you know that over in the book of Nehemiah, some people were put out of the priesthood because their lineage had been corrupted? Yeah, or it, could, yeah, it couldn't be proven. So, 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 so anyone who wanted to, anyone who wanted to could go into, I believe they kept it in the synagogue. A anyone who wanted to could go into the synagogue and check the lineage of Christ. And they could see just what we've seen. They knew he was the Messiah. They could go, but see, Matthew proves he was the Messiah, he is the Messiah, right out of the gate. That's why, that, that's, why he wrote, that's why the book of Matthew was written. And next week, we're going to get into it a little bit this week. We've got to talk about context. 
just a little bit because we're going to be dealing with some things like parables. And a parable is going to be a, a big way that Christ teaches. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned about parables is a lot of times, would you, in homiletics, in homiletics a couple of weeks ago, all the students had to do their final exam. They had to preach an expository sermon on, they had to preach an expository sermon on the Good Samaritan. Every one of them had the same text. And it, and it gave me a lot of notes, and, which is one of the reasons I had them do it, because now I got a lot of notes on the Good Samaritan. I got a lot of good stuff on the Good Samaritan. But, but, but a lot of times, somebody will just open up a parable and just start preaching the parable. Well, you can do that, but to really understand the context, you have to deal with why Christ is presenting the parable. You know, because in almost every case where you have a parable in, in, in the Gospels, there's some 40 parables in the Gospels. In almost every case, he, he is either answering a question that he's been asked. He's answering a question. He's dealing with a particular topic of instruction or answering a question. Or he's confronting the corrupt religious establishment. See, it wasn't the drug addicts and the drunks that conspired to kill Jesus. It was the religious establishment. And listen, for years they tried to debate with him philosophically. They tried to expose him philosophically. They tried to put his philosophy at odds with the philosophy of the law and expose him in his words. And the last verse in chapter 22 or 23 of Matthew, it said, I never can remember if it's 22 or 23, but it says there that it says they ask, it says no man ask him any more questions. That's what it says. It says no man ask him any more questions. And from that point on, they abandon the idea of trying to expose him philosophically. And, and, and they go straight to breaking their own laws to try to kill him. Do you know, do you know in his, uh, when they went to Caiaphas' house in the middle of the night? Do you know the Sanhedrin was not even supposed to be meeting at night? The Sanhedrin was supposed to meet, they were supposed to meet at the, at the southeast corner of Solomon's porch in, in, in the temple courts in the daytime. Everything they'd done, every decision they made was to be done in the light of day. They, broke the, they went from asking them questions to breaking their own laws in, in, order to just, in order to just blatantly murder him. And it was the religious establishment. It was not the dregs of society. Now, I know this probably seems kind of boring right now. The first week of any study usually is. But I promise you this is going to be interesting. I promise you we're going to get into some things and we're going to present some perspectives and we're going to have some discussion. But for right now, we only got a few more minutes. And let's, 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 we talk about context a lot here. We talk about context a lot, particularly at this church. But... Be careful when someone says, be careful when someone says, well, that's just your interpretation. You can't apply, the, the, there, there are parts of scripture that you, can, that you can make a lot of applications. But you can't, see, basically, saying, well, that's just your interpretation, is basically the same as saying, well, that's your opinion. The Bible, was not, the, the, the Bible is not a collection of open-ended statements. That, that's left up to our opinion. Things have to be read in context. A text without a context is a pretext. And we've talked about this before in, in weeks past. But a context is going to be, we're going to define it as a, a, a specific setting of a portion of scripture. And how the surrounding passages influence interpretation. The specific setting of a portion of scripture and how surrounding passages influence interpretation. Now, I've given you this example before. Let me give you an example and then we're going to close and we're going to get into it more next week. There are four different types of context that we, that we really have to get into before we can delve specifically into the Gospels. Okay, I've, I've given this example before. Um, we have an all-night preacher's meeting. We go for 12 or 14 hours like they used to do. Go for 12 or 14 hours. And brother, Sean, brother Shane Tucker is, is about on his last leg. 
and he stumbles out and he's about to go into the about to go into the ladies bathroom and I'm out there pretending like I'm sick because I don't want to sit in here anymore so I'm just out there hanging out like people do sometimes all right and, and he's about to stumble into the ladies bathroom and I say don't go in there and he and he gets himself together he's like man thank you brother Paul I was about to stumble into the ladies bathroom I appreciate that three days later three days later his wife sends him to the store and, and, and he's and he's and he's walking through the double doors at Winn-Dixie and, and he hears my words don't go in there he turns around gets back in his vehicle drives home and says brother Paul said I couldn't go in there now did he quote me accurately that's exactly what I said I said don't go in there but he took what I said out of context you see you, you, you see what kind of dangerous things can happen when you when you take something out of context let me give you let me give you part of a verse so that's what that's what people do they get they, they quote parts of verses Matthew says two or three times to endure to the end if you want salvation you got to endure to the end and there's a whole denomination of people who says oh I've had them say it to me personally oh brother Paul I got to hold out to the end I got to hold out to the end well, they've taken what's been said in the book of Matthew and they've taken it out of context. So context is the specific settings of a portion of scripture and how that setting, how that setting influences interpretation. And we're going to get into the four different types of context next week and, and, and we're going to get more specifically into the book of Matthew. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you stay with us. I hope you come ready to learn something. We're going to have discussion. It's not going to be me talking all the, all, all the time. And I promise you, I promise you it's not going to be boring. I promise. But the first weeks of anytime you start a new study, sometimes it can be a little dry. But we're going to have a good time going through the book of Matthew. I'm going to have Brother Grover Patrick stand and close us in prayer, please, sir.